Our next speaker is Shavan O'Sullivan. She is a research fellow at the School of Social and Political Science at the University of Melbourne. She has been studying animal rights and the animal protection movement for more than 10 years. In her, in her presentation, Shawan will argue that liberal democracies carry with them two promises that might be efficient, uh, effectively used to safeguard the interests of non-human animals. The promise of equity, equity and uh, I said equi yeah. equity <laughs> and the commitment to transparency and citizen engagement in decision making. Welcome Shawan O'Sullivan. Okay, well the first thing to say is that it's an absolute joy to be here. It's just been the most wonderful conference. If I look a bit uh, tubby, I was five kilos lighter when I arrived here uh, three days ago, so I blame the conference. Uh, but it's absolutely wonderful to have so many people together to talk about animal issues and to have it done in such an affordable way so everyone can be part of the conversation is absolutely fantastic. So uh, I tip my hat to the organisers and I think it's wonderful that you've all come and I hope this conference continues for many years to come. And of course it's my pleasure to be here and to be part of it. So my name's Siobhan O'Sullivan. I'm from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, a little bit about my background, I was involved uh, in the animal protection movement in Australia for many years, so I was an animal activist uh, based in New South Wales and I was working a lot with Animal Liberation New South Wales. I was doing things like uh, all the regular things that animal activists do, um, you know, doing flyers, going to meetings, talking to people, etc, etc. But one of the things that had a very big impact on me was um, in Australia, we have a long history of doing what we call open rescue. So we go into factory farms primarily and we um, have a look at the conditions of the animals. We document uh, what we see inside. We often will rescue some animals, maybe take them away to get a veterinary report on their condition and so the health they're in, and also then take the information to the media to try and get some publicity. And uh, what I discovered very quickly was that when you go into a factory farm and you see the, uh, the suffering, including the scale of the suffering, but more than that, when you take one individual animal out of those battery cages where they're there with you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of other birds, and you look at that individual animal, uh, most people are moved to compassion. Most people see something terribly wrong with what uh, the animal looks like, with what we're doing to the animal. And um, as I've said on many occasions before, even if you're not somebody who um, is moved to, to be vegan, I think the human instinct in many cases would be to think, I'm not going to eat uh, an egg from that animal who looks terribly sick. So I myself observed this compassion firsthand. And when I started my PhD in 2003, I knew I wanted to do it on animal rights, but you know, it takes a little while to think about what exactly you want to do it on. But um, I decided in the end to have a look at why it is that we treat some animals better than others. Now, as you probably aware, even the most privileged animals in uh, both Australia and around the world suffer terrible cruelty and the laws routinely fail even the most privileged animals. But if we accept that the law is flawed even when it's trying to do its, even when it is doing its best work, it still leaves us with an interesting question to consider why the law is better for some animals and worse for others. Now traditionally when people have thought about this issue, um, they've said, oh it's all about economics, it's all about money. The reason we have laws that are good for some animals and bad for other animals is that we just want to make money off some types of animals and because we want to make money off some types of animals, we make exemptions in the law which means that these, the animals that are valuable to us as a commodity can be treated poorly. So for example, the classic example is in Australia and elsewhere uh, in the world, we have laws that stop you doing a whole lot of things to companion animals that are perfectly legal to do to farm animals or to um, agricultural animals. And so people say, oh, it's all about economics. 
So what I wanted to see is whether it really is just all about economics, whether there's something else going on that maybe informs why our laws for animals look the way they do. And with my interest in uh, looking inside factory farms, uh, seeing how the animals suffer, seeing how the animals live, and sharing that information, the question I was interested in is, how much does visibility matter? How much does it matter that people can see and know what goes on inside these places? So my findings are published in my book, Animals, Equality and Democracy. Uh, my book is hideously overpriced. It's absolutely disgusting how much money the publisher wants people to pay for it. Uh, so don't buy the book because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you what I write in the book. If you're really, really interested in the topic, my PhD thesis is actually available online for free. The book's more fun to read, but it costs $140 if you can believe that. So it's, yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> Don't buy the book. Okay. <laughs> but before I tell you what I found, I need to just set the scene, just give you a little bit of background. And a lot of this, of course, will be known to you guys because you're the people at the front line, you're the people who know better than anyone else how animals live, how animals suffer, and how animals die. So this is what we see of a battery farm. This is where battery hens uh, live to lay com a commercial egg production unit. This is what you can see of a battery hen when you go about your day-to-day -day life, when you're maybe driving down the street, when you're maybe going for a walk in the country. This is what you can see. Um, but of course, this only tells a very small part of the story. As we all know, this is what it looks like on the inside. So from the outside, it looks quite um, innocuous. On the, from the outside, it could be any kind of shed. But on the inside, what we see is terrible suffering. So the question is, does it matter, how much does it matter when we're creating laws for animals that from the outside, the community can't see what's going on, but on the inside, of course, what we see is suffering. In the animal rights debate, a lot of uh, people involved in animal rights law have talked a lot about the fact that animals are property items. And they think the fact that animals are private property to be bought and sold means that they don't get rights. It means that it's, it, it's a bad thing for animals. One of the things that I want to say uh, in my work on animals is that the fact that animals are private property items isn't a good thing for them. It probably does mean that at law they are very vulnerable to bad treatment. But the rights debate doesn't end with the fact that animals are private property items. They also live almost exclusively within private property. The only people that can see these animals lawfully are people who have a financial or pecuniary interest in their suffering. So the fact that private property relations also renders a lot of animals invisible, in my view, is a really big important issue. So the first point what I want to make is that many animals are only visible to those who have a direct interest in their suffering. The other thing I want to say is that animal welfare law in Australia, in the UK, in America, throughout Europe is terribly inconsistent. And you guys will all know this, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So the rabbit is a classic example that really clearly demonstrates this inconsistency. So a rabbit can be a companion animal living in someone's backyard in a hutch. hatch. A rabbit can be used in research, of course. A rabbit can be used for agricultural purposes, either for meat or for fur farming. An animal can be a com uh, an exhibited animal, so in a petting zoo for little children to molest. <laughs> or an animal can be a free-living animal, uh, depending on what context they're in or what other interests are at play. They'll either be deemed to be uh, a native animal and therefore people like them, or a pest species, like we say in Australia, and then people want to see them dead. So the law is inconsistent. And that inconsistency influences how we create the law. So there is no law in Australia, in the UK, throughout the European Union called the law for the protection of rabbits. 
And there's no law that exists only to think about what it is that a rabbit benefits from and what kind of protections we should afford rabbits if we want rabbits to have a good life. Instead, the way we create laws for animals is dependent entirely on how we want to make use of them. So it's a very, very instrumental way of creating legal protection for animals. So what's on the screen now is a table or a diagram that shows how we typically uh, codify animals in order to create laws. So the first big division we make is between those animals who are free living and those animals who are captive. So the free living ones are normally considered to be wildlife, either a pest species or a native species, and their protections in law are probably going to be wound up with environmental protection. So typically they're seen as part of an ecosystem and whatever protections they have come as part of a, a component of a larger whole. The animals that I'm interested in are the other types of animals, the captive animals, usually animals that we breed. So almost all animal welfare legislation we create is for animals that we've purposely brought into this world, typically because we either want to make money for them, from them or use them in some way. And when we uh, create legislation for these captive animals, the first thing we do is we make a very big distinction between those who are economically productive, so those that we can make money off, and those who are not. So those who aren't economically productive really tend to be the companion animals. So no one gets rich by owning a dog, no one's going to make money by having a cat, and in fact those animals tend to be a cost. So they're not a production unit, they're a cost to us. On the other side, we have those animals that we breed or hold captive because we think it's going to make us money in some way. Um, and so they're grouped according to, again, specifically their use. And so the groups are typically agricultural animals, research and education animals, animals that we use for exhibits, zoos, circuses, sporting events. And then there are a few other little animals that we use in a small group, maybe for law enforcement or things like that. And the way we construct our animal welfare laws reflects these types of uses. And it's because they reflect these types of uses that we get all these inconsistencies. Because the way the law is structured is that you, generally it starts with an opening statement saying you can't be cruel to animals. And then it has all these exemptions which pertain to particular types of animals. So for example, in Australia, uh, we, we have an animal welfare law that says you can't be cruel to animals. And then at the back of the law we say, but this doesn't apply to agricultural animals. Um, in New South Wales, we have this fabulous, uh, crazy, it's not fabulous for the animals, but it's a fabulous example of how crazy human beings can be when they want to try and uh, make sure they can be cruel to animals while looking like they're trying to be kind to them. So we've got a section in the law in New South Wales which says that animals shouldn't be held uh, restrained by a cage unless they're the kind of animal that's normally kept in a cage. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is how the law works. It gives with one hand and it takes away with the other. And of course the kind of animals that are normally kept in cages are factory farmed animals. So my question then was, is it just all about economics? If it is all about economics, then in that captive group, what we should see is the law always better for companion animals because they're not economically productive and always worse for the economically productive group. But what I noticed was that even among the economically productive group, there were variations. Some groups do get better protection than others. Some cruel treatments in, that are, even though they make money, have either been prohibited or curtailed, and others have not. So, what I wanted to know is, is there a relationship between seeing and knowing about animal suffering and demands placed upon the state to use its authority to prohibit or curtail that suffering? So we live in a liberal democracy, Liberal democracies bring certain promises, and one of them is that the community will be involved in setting standards, including animal welfare standards. So I wanted to find out, is it just about money, or can the community, does the community have the power to intervene to protect animals against suffering where they know about the suffering? 
So uh, this was all very complicated to do in a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. I had to choose some case study animals because there are so many laws and bylaws and everything else. So I, choose, I chose four animals, horses, hens, rabbits and dogs. Very commonly used animals, exploited in a whole range of different ways. So they weren't, you know, specific, like it wasn't like great apes or dolphins or, you know, extraordinary animals. These were just very standard animals. And then using the categories that were on the screen previously, the way in which we codify animals into law, I had a look at an example for each of them. So, for example, animals used in, horses used in research, uh, horse racing is an example of an exhibited animal, police horses for an uh, assistance animal. Of course, a lot of people have horses that they ride. Hens used in agricultural system, this is a broiler hen. Exhibited hens, cockfighting, of course, uh, companion hens, people do just have them in their backyard pecking around. Uh, rabbits used for fur, rabbits used in research, rabbit used in penning zoo, uh, dogs used in research, dogs uh, used for exhibits, for performances and things like that. Um, this is a military uh, dog um, and a companion dog. So what did I find? The first thing I found is that economics does matter a lot. So the, as I said, the standard understanding of why our laws are so inconsistent and so bad for some animals and a little bit better for others is it's all about economics. And that's true. So I don't want to leave you with the idea that economics doesn't matter. Economics matters a lot. The reason you can have three hens in a battery cage but you're not allowed to do that at home is about economics. So economics is really the key principal driver. But it's not the only driver. Animal visibility does influence how we treat animals. It's a secondary influence, but it does have an influence. So I found a very consistent relationship between how visible an animal is and how well the law protects the animal from harm. The higher the visibility the animal had, the better the, pro the protection against harm, and the lower the visibility, the worse the protection against harm. In my thesis, which as I said, you can look at online or the book if you're uh, very wealthy, um, you'll see that I spent a lot of time trying to establish which types of animals are highly visible and which are not visible. Of course, the animals that are the most visible are the animals that we use for exhibiting. So nobody runs a secret zoo, nobody runs a circus where nobody's allowed to come and watch. Exhibiting animals is specifically intended to be a highly visible activity. People want you to look at their animals. And the laws protecting exhibited animals have continually improved uh, over the last 200 years, including a lot of prohibitions against things that are very harmful to animals. The animals that are the least visible, of course, are agricultural and research animals, and we have not seen the same uh, improvements in those areas. But that said, animal activists have done a very good job of trying to make the invisible visible, and where they have focused their energies very effectively and persistently, they have been able to begin to make changes and create that visibility that will get people thinking about issues. And so in Australia, an example of that is the battery cage. No one was thinking about the battery cage or talking about the battery cage, but animal activists have made that visible and the battery cage will be a thing of history in Australia in the future. So the community does care about suffering. It's not just about money, it's not just cynical. The community does care about suffering, but they have to be made aware of it. And this is one of the challenges because there's only so much awareness you can bring to something that is structurally invisible. And so uh, I think, you know, really it, it's, it's, a, it's a grind. We're always up against it as people concerned about animals incidental suffering is invisible and so part of the role of the animal activist community is to make the invisible visible. But when, what I found in my research though is that there are anomalies. So it doesn't always just flow visibility to good welfare protection or prohibition against particular uses and poor visibility vice versa. There are a few anomalies. Um, so 
pop very popular species of animals, even when their act the activity they're used in is low visibility, will get better protection. So, for example, in Australia, we use something like, you know, 17 million mice, rabbits, guinea pigs and uh, rats in animal research and like 12 great apes and we've got better protection for great apes than all these other animals. Uh, same with dogs in Australia for animal research. We've got two special laws looking after dogs who are a tiny proportion of the animals used in research and nothing for rabbits. So being a popular species of animal is always good when it comes to this uh, issue of getting the law to work for you. Um, and then on the other side of the scale, there are certain activities that even though they're highly visible, there's so much moneyed interest involved, it's very hard to get change, and horse racing is a good example of that. So economic interests can override communities' uh, concern, but as a general principle, I think there is very good evidence to believe that if you demonstrate suffering to the community, they will respond slowly, and not all that you want, but there is evidence of a response. So, the work that animal activists do in penetrating invisible environments in which animals are suffering and bringing that suffering to light is really critically important work. If you ever doubt that what you do when you go into a factory farm, capture images and then distribute them is worthwhile, I want to reassure you that I think that it is, uh, is very worthwhile and we've got to keep it up. Um, but, of course, the problem is that because it's been so good and so effective, there is a move uh, in America and it's uh, starting to happen in Australia to make it even more difficult for animal activists to do this work of trespass and exposing us suffering in invisible places. Um, and I know that it's touching Europe as well and there's been quite a few discussions about it over these past few days. So I very helpfully came up with a solution uh, in my book and my thesis. It's, it's a bit theoretical, but I'll run it by you anyway uh, and see if anyone, as they say, I'll run it up the flagpole and see if anyone salutes. So one of the things that I say in my, um, my book is that we live in a liberal democracy and liberal democracies have certain characteristics that make them like, unlike other types of political uh, organisations. So there are things that you can expect from a liberal democracy. And one of them is equity. That's a basically a bedrock fundamental principle of a liberal democracy. So you will have uh, equality in many, many different realms. Uh, everyone's entitled to a fair trial by jury. Everyone's entitled to a vote and each vote's counted once. Those kinds of things make a, a liberal democracy unlike other types of political organisations. So what I say is maybe what we can say as a strategy for animal activists is to begin trying to push the authorities to engage this equity principle when they create laws for animals. So what I say is, look, we're, we're creating all these laws, we're creating them in the normal way, they're going through parliament, they're part of the liberal democratic landscape, but they're not actually liberal democratic in their um, sentiment because they're inequitable, they're inconsistent, they favour some animals over others for no other reason but it suits us. And that's not the way we're supposed to do things in a liberal democracy. So I say, why don't we try and push for the equity principle when we create laws? Don't tolerate exemptions. If a rabbit will suffer um, in one context, then that suffering should be acknowledged in the other. We shouldn't just say, oh, well, but now they're in a factory farm, they can be in a tiny cage, it doesn't matter. In Australia, for example, when an animal is on exhibit in a zoo, so that means so people can see them, their cage is much bigger than when they're out the back off exhibit. So as soon as you take an animal out the back, you can suddenly put them in a smaller cage. Um, when you transport birds to slaughter, suddenly they can be in much smaller cages than they are normally. And those cages are tiny, tiny, tiny compared to the kind of cage you keep a dog in if you're taking a dog off to a grooming salon. And so what I want to say is what, why, do, why are these inconsistencies? These inconsistencies offend the way we do uh, our political society and we should be bringing that to people's attention. But the other uh, kind of advantage of what I want to suggest, which is we engage the equity principle, 
is if we said, look, we want all laws for rabbits, for example, to, to be consistent across the board, then in a sense we would be able to get around this invisibility problem because we do know some rabbits, some people have companion animal rabbits, some people have rabbits in petting zoos, and if we say, look, the laws that apply to them should be carried right across the board to all animals, then we actually wouldn't have to go into these invisible places because we would already be able to tie the laws to the animals that we can see. So anyway, that's just one thought experiment about one way we might get around this problem of the relationship between visibility and better welfare protection for animals. Um, if you're interested in this at all, please feel free to look us up. And just a little add, uh, in January next year, we're having a conference in Australia. Uh, and uh, I know it's a long way, but if you feel like a jaunt out to Australia in July next year, we'd love to have you there. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. about him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that there's at different attitudes. I think that some people are critical of him. They see his work as too conservative and not taking a strong enough line against some types of suffering. Uh, other people think that he did a very important job in establishing the principles that influenced this movement and he was also very, very involved in setting up the animal protection movement in Australia. So our biggest organisations were all either directly influenced by him or established by him, but some of them have moved on. Um, the problem I think that Singer has that we all have is that time marches forward and people come up with more radical or uh, variant uh, ways of thinking about things and his book was written you know, back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So uh, how appreciated is him? Very much by some, he's criticised by others. He uh, can certainly pull a big crowd though when he speaks, he, he, uh, the people turn up to hear him. Does that answer your question? What is your personal view? I think that uh, I like utilitarianism quite a lot. I think for me, a utilitarian framework tends to be more appealing than a deontological framework. I find a deontological framework, uh, m I associate that more with kind of an American political ideology and more a religious type of being, whereas for me, I think utilitarianism is a preferable um, method of, of, of moral questioning. I think Singer did important work. Hello. Um, uh, my biggest concern is um, that we're no longer living in liberal democracies, but more in neoliberal democracies, where equity is more like a charade. Uh, rich people buying their sentences of in court, big business uh, buying their sentences of in court as well. Um, shouldn't it be better opposing that system, like the animal movement being more anti-capitalist instead of using the system? Um. I think that, I think one thing I'd say is I think it's for people to express their desire to improve things for animals and to use their energies in the way that speaks best for them. So I don't know that there's just one way to do things. I think one of the things about social movements is that they're complicated and they're multifaceted and people kind of attack the problem and think about the issue from a range of ways. Mm. So I don't want to prescribe, I, not only don't I think, I, not only don't I think that's particularly useful, but I also um, you know, don't think people would change their way of doing things because of what I say. So I think people should do what speaks to them, but I think you're right, we should be concerned that moneyed interests are starting to be increasingly inf influential, the gap between the rich and the poor is expanding, um, you know, the, pr the structural problems identified as part of the global financial crisis haven't been addressed, they've in fact been entrenched. So there are reasons, excuse me, to be concerned. However, 
I think the community does still care. I think there still is room for empathy and compassion. And in Australia, I see a lot of people trying to push back against a lot of very heartless policies, the way we treat asylum seekers, things we do to the environment, the way we treat animals. So I actually do think that human beings still do have the capacity for goodness. And at the moment, we still do have a political system that has some capacity to intervene for the good cause, even if it's not going to make money. So I've got some faith in that. I myself um, don't feel that what, how I want to use my energy is to first oppose capitalism and then oppose animals. I, I feel that I want to try to use the tools that I see available to me as best I can now for animals. So that, that's my way of thinking about the problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shabon, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank Can you. you speak to the practical? How do you see the practical application of your research to the work that animal activists do uh, in their communities and nationally and internationally? Thanks. Uh, so the first thing I think is we need to keep looking inside these places where we're not supposed to be. Another line of research that I've been doing in the last few years is about trespass and I think that when animal activists go into factory farms, uh, collect information and distribute it with a view to changing laws or influencing policy, that they're acting in a way that's consistent with the best uh, spirit of civil disobedience. So the first thing is, if you ever doubt whether people need to know or need to be reminded about animal suffering, my view is that they do, and this is the work that should be, should be occurring. And in, in my book and in my research, I talk a lot about different ways of knowing, and I think one of the problems we have is that because these anim this animal suffering is so structurally obscured, so, so invisible, it's not part of our daily life. I mean, I've been in Luxembourg now for three days, I've seen plenty of eggs, cheese, dairy, meat. I've not seen a single animal other than a few dogs. So where are the animals? This is the question, where are the animals? So we've got to do this work of showing people where the animals are, how they're living, how they're dying, how they're suffering. And it's not, I don't mean to have a go at Luxembourg, same in Australia, you can be in Australia for 10 years and never see a single animal. So I think that work of bringing the visibility and bringing it again and again and again and reminding people the problem's not been solved, it's not gone away. You, you don't stop eating eggs for three weeks and then go back to it. It's still a problem. I think that's a practical aspect of the work. Um, and the other thing is, if you are in a position where you deal with politicians or you deal with um, departments or people who write policy, I would be pointing up the inconsistency and saying to them, why is it okay to do it this way in this case and not in the other case? And push the inconsistency line. I mean, in Australia, for example, if a puppy in a pet store becomes ill, only a vet can euthanise. If a rabbit in a pet store becomes ill, anyone can kill the rabbit. Well, wh why, why the hell does that law exist? What, what, what's, who's that serving? Why does that... So that's the kind of anomaly that I would be questioning, and I think by identifying and challenging inconsistencies, you can push people to acknowledge where bias exists or acknowledge illegitimate biases as well. So, so that's what I would recommend. Well, then thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>